for people who look at grants, they just want to see that you keep applying and that you're just getting better and refining your vision because these applications are so thorough that they want to know for sure that you know exactly what you're doing. You are listening to Talk Doc to Me, a podcast that dives deep into the art of documentary through conversations with filmmakers and industry professionals. I'm your host, Leah DeLeon, fellow doc filmmaker, and today I am excited to share this space with So Young Um. So is a Korean American director and producer based and born in Los Angeles. Her first feature film, Liquor Store Dreams, is an intimate portrait of two Korean American children of liquor store owners who set out to bridge generational divides with their immigrant parents in Los Angeles. The film premiered at Tribeca this year in 2022. So is a CAM, which means Center for Asian American Media, 2021 fellow with mentorship support from acclaimed director Nan Fu Wong, and was a recipient of the Sundance Uprise Grant and a Sundance Institute Documentary Film Program grantee. Wow. So is a brave, bold, and badass storyteller. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so we're going to kick it off with a game of this or that. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Documentary or narrative? Documentary. <laughs> Woo, I knew that was going to be a that tough one. That was a one. hard one, yeah. Mac or PC? Mac. Text or call? <sighs> call. Instagram or TikTok? TikTok. Sony or Canon? No preference. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Tequila or vodka? Oh, I don't drink, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, okay. Now are you ready to talk doc to me? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. So before Liquor Store Dreams was a feature, it was a short film. Both mm -hmm. the short and the feature are deeply personal and you star as a main character. What was the journey of involving yourself as a character you see on screen? Was that always your vision or like how did it change over time? So I was part of this fellowship called Arm with a Camera Fellowship, which is by Visual Communications, which they host the Asian American Film Festival every year in L.A. And I've been applying to that fellowship for a couple of years. And I think you have to have a concept ready. And I, I think after like the third try, I said, hey, maybe I should just do something that I, I've always wanted to do. And that seems a little bit more personal to me. And that is doable, accessible, just with given the, the budget and the time length. And when I finally got accepted, I think I just was thinking, what is some, yeah. So basically what is something, a story I always want to tell. And I always want to tell a story about me, my dad and his liquor store. I always felt like there was something in this space that I felt like I needed to explore as children of liquor store owners, we always say, hey, like it doesn't feel very special or there's no real story here, but I felt I needed to kind of dig in deeper. And because the space and my dad was so accessible to me, I thought I would do a story about us. And that's kind of initially how it started. Mm -hmm. And then once it was a short and I heard that everyone was like, we want more, we want more. How did how did that journey change once it was a feature? A feature is huge, right? So there's a lot of uh, space to fill. Um, you use voiceover. We see you, you know, transform through the film as well. Like, what kind of what what was that like for you? Like, was it difficult being a director and also a character, or like based on some of the support that you had from your team? Like, what was the feedback as far as like integrating yourself in a in a in a way? that is still universal. Mm -hmm. I think because I grew up in the internet age that vlogging always came pretty naturally to me. So I was my own main character in a lot of mediums. And I think when I pivoted into a short film and then even a feature, first, I think after I did this short film, it was probably the first time me collaborating with another editor, Jean Reem, who is amazing. And I think she brought a lot to the project. And I think it was the first time I actually made something really good and so, something really personal. And I think because it resonated with people so much, I didn't know how to go from a short to a feature. It just felt like so much, such a bigger project. I've never done it. And I think it was such a learning um, journey for me, just trying to navigate, how do I even do this? And what is the story here? And can I even fill 90 
90 minutes. And it wasn't until a year later where I actually saw a quote unquote ending to my story that I felt like, okay, well, I can kind of see the trajectory of the full length film. And so let's try to map it out. And I I don't think I would have ever done it if I didn't see what the end could look like, just because I wouldn't, I'm not the type of person who I want to film for years and years and years. I kind of had a like end date in mind. And so with that, I, that's kind of how I started my journey. And I think how I integrated myself just because I was in the short film and I was going to use the same material. I said, okay, well, how do I expand this that I could also still involve myself and how can I tell the story in the most efficient way possible? And I think the short was more verte. It was a little bit more natural. Whereas I felt like with the, the feature, I really had to pivot and, provide so much backstory that I felt the need to actually narrate and do voiceover, which was really hard for me just because there was just so much to explain. Yeah. And I was like, how do I explain everything without having to explain everything? And I got a lot of mentorship from Nemfu and a lot of people. That's something Nemfu is so good at is narrating, especially at the right time, right place. And I, I learned a lot and it was probably the most challenging part of the filmmaking process, just figuring out what to say at the, at the right sh- moment. And I, I think maybe because I have been vlogging, I have been making stuff for so long that I didn't feel it was just on me for the feature because obviously my dad's one of the main characters. Danny Park is also another character for me. It was like, I'm really a narrator. I'm not on camera as much as they are because I'm the one holding the camera. And even if I am on camera, what is, there should be a point to me being on camera as well. Mm -hmm. And what, what kind of advice did you get from Nanfu? Like as far as the recording voiceover, like what kind of, what kind of tips did you learn doing this? Obviously it's hard because you want to say so much. So it's like, just say the most important thing that your audience needs to know at that time. And the thing with writing voiceovers is that you could just write excessively. And then it's like, if there's five sentences, how can you actually say it in one sentence? Or do you even need to, you know, have that sentence at all? Can you just say it with, with the shot that you have? Show, not tell. mm -hmm. And so it was like a combination of both. What can I, what can I relate to the audience that kind of sends both messages at the same time. I think a lot of documentary filmmakers at one point in their career like think about making a personal film or actually make a personal film, but not all are successful because it's hard it's hard sometimes to to look outside yourself and 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 kind of have that bird's eye perspective of how to make it universal and still yet deeply personal. Uh what what did you, what about your story did you find universal and like needed in this space right now? Uh, somebody who watches a lot of films, I think I didn't ever want to tell a story if it's been told before. So me having to watch every single documentary narrative that relates to the 92 LA uprisings or current American stories, like what can I provide that will, that will fit into like the current American cinema canon? And I think... I obviously got so much help from my editor, Christina Sun Kim, because she also provided an outsider perspective. Even though she's Korean American as well, she also grew up in Korea. So she kind of understands like both my parents and myself. And because she also grew up in Texas, also has an outside view of what people in LA have been through and what we know. And I think just having collaborations like that and kind of thinking through the process of, Well, our story is universal because at the end of the day, it is about America and our difficulties or conflicts with our parents. These are issues that we we all tackle. And so even though we were really specific in our like Korean American culture and journey, I think they always say the more specific it is, the more universal. And so I think um, that was pretty of the moment pretty much the mantra that we went with. And from the outside, you know, this feels like a filmmaker's dream to receive a grant from Sundance to premiering at Tribeca. Um, congratulations. I, Thank I you. also I also know that with that success, there's a lot of no's and a lot of rejections along the way. Like 
Can you talk through that and how you persevered and, and decided to stick with the story? For sure. I think because I knew how important the story was to not just me, but to my people. And I knew that this was a story that would probably outlive me. That that was kind of my North Star. It's like every time I felt down or I had a rejection or whatever, like I needed to finish this film at at all costs. And so it was really hard just because it was my first film. It was such a learning curve. And I faced probably more than 50 grant rejections every year. And it is like a full-time job trying to apply to these grants. And so- I get you, girl. I'm getting those rejections right yes. now. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. And I think for me, it's not the rejections that I feel so bad um, about because it, there's always time and place for these things. And I totally understand. And I think it wasn't until 2020 when- COVID hit and George Floyd got murdered, that so many of these issues that we were facing with in America, as well as Korean Americans were coming to the forefront. And so the urgency of the story just got like zero to a hundred. It just got so much more serious. And I think a lot of the people that were looking at grants really saw that, hey, she's obviously with, with or without people's help. She's obviously going to finish this. And that if we want to be part of it and we want to support, this is the right time to support it because, because it is this important. I think for people who look at grants, they just want to see that you keep applying and that you're just getting better and refining your vision because these applications are so thorough that they want to know for sure that you know exactly what you're doing and the, what you're going to use the money for, how you're going to, how you're going to fulfill your vision basically. And I think it took probably three years to get there to really figure it out just because documentaries change so often and you never know where the story's going to lead. So the best thing to do is really continue to film. Ah, the journey that we lead is is a is a crazy one sometimes, honestly. I mean, three years, tough. three years of of you know, fifty plus rejections every year and just trying to refine, refine, refine. I mean, it's it's tough. It's so tough. <laughs> but it's it's good. It's good to hear stories like this because, you know, on the other side, it's it can be disheartening sometimes or filmmaking like documentary filmmaking can be super lonely also at times. Um, can, can you talk about the team that you built and how, how they each, uh, you know, helped form liquor store dreams or how you, yeah. how you, how you, uh, managed a team and how you grew together and kind of what, what strengths everyone mm -hmm. brought to the table? So I think from the very beginning, I did the short film, uh, I think that finished 2018. So that was mostly me and Jean. And Jean edited the short. And then when it got to the feature, and that was something we started in 2019. So I think, I'm not really good at math. So it's been like about three, four years that we've been making this film. And I think for the first half of it, it was just me. And I was producing, I was editing a little bit, and then directing, doing the crowdfunding campaign. I don't recommend doing everything by yourself. But it's also hard for me because I didn't have money to pay either me or somebody else. So I had to take on the burden to do every single thing. And until we crowdfunded and raised $30,000 and found an investor, like I, that's when I brought Christina Sun Kim, my editor on board. And then for a very long time, it was just us two. And then after we finally got the Sundance grant, this just became so much more serious that I felt like I needed somebody who was more business minded, which Eddie Kim, who has done previous uh, docu-series before, K-Town Role Models, and um, has been working in a lot of tech startups that I needed somebody more business savvy than myself that will help me basically not get screwed over for just going forward and handling all the logistics, legal, things like that. So I always say work with people who are obviously better than you and that complement to with you because you are going to be in a relationship with this person day in, day out, you may fight. There's a lot of, there's a lot and it's very stressful. So you have to really build a strong team where you you have the liberty and the space to call things out and they can call you out. And so it's definitely a learning curve. Um, but I think you can kind of feel like, hey, do we vibe? Can we be in this for the long haul? Because you don't want to bring on somebody and be like, ooh, actually we're on a very different page. And some people might have very different goals in mind. And so I think 
just being transparent from the very beginning. Um, and I think, so it was always bringing out people who can provide specific things. So if I'm really good at this one thing, I'm just going to do this. Eddie was really good at doing logistical business. He's very like, he's a producer. He's like a, yeah, he's a producer, <laughs> like a very natural producer. So I had to bring him on. And I think there was a lot of people that just who were able to bring their strengths and then was able to, they just really loved the project. And so I think it was great to kind of get a mixture of a lot of people. What have you learned about yourself uh, like delegating to other people and like letting go of, of some of those aspects. Cause I think all documentary filmmakers do, you have to come up kind of knowing everything. You have to know how to shoot. You have to know how to edit. You have to know how to self distribute. Um, but now that you're having that community support behind you, like what were some challenges or like ways that you've grown yourself? Like as this transition has been happening, the whole journey and working with people like you get to choose who you want to work with and you should never feel burdened to work with somebody. So every step of the way, whether it's bringing Eddie on my producer or bringing on my PR team or sales team, like there is an extensive interview process and getting to know each other and even bringing on Diane Kwan and Daniel J. Chalfin as my executive producers, like there was an extensive period of just talking to people and figuring out, hey, are we on the same page? Do we have the same vision and goals? Because you do not want to get into bed with people that you do not have the same um, vision with. And I think that's that feels so obvious because it, it's like courting or dating and you're going to be in a relationship with them. So you should get to know people. And I, I felt like I maybe I was just lucky or pretty perceptive or I just get along with people. I'm pretty, I'm pretty transparent that we always laid out, this is what we want. This is what we're expecting to get. And how does this sound for you? Is this, this is work with you and just being super communicative all the way through has been really helpful for me. And I think, yes, bringing on quote unquote outside people who haven't been with your film, having them also understand what you want, because they might also have very different goals. Just because, you know, people in Hollywood, like they have very uh, different perception of what success could look like. And I think just being on the same page is probably the most important thing. And you mentioned bringing on executive producers. Like what what is an executive producer? What does an executive producer do? And for you specifically, how did your executive producers help Liquor Store Dreams? So the, the main thing that I say about executive producers that I feel like I really fumbled on is that I didn't secure an executive producer before I applied to film festivals. People might not, people might say, oh, it's not important, but it was very important for me just because I think I needed not only their name, but their support and their help for me to start the process to apply. And I think I did that very late in the process, which helped me yes and no, but I think- At what like point- said, at what point in the process did you bring them on? Like I brought it them was on final cut or after I started submitting to film fans, film festivals and when I talk when I say like the dating or the courting phase that sometimes it was going on for like 4 plus years. These are people I've I've known and I've been talking to and I don't take relationships pretty like lightly. So for me it's like okay, well, I'm not just like gonna be like, hey, do you want to be on this? And then like bounce. And so with Diane Kwan, I've been talking to her for four years. And I always said, hey, would you like to come on as a producer? And Diane was, and this was kind of coming, she was coming off of the success of Mining the Gap. And she was just having so many projects. And I think not good timing, right? So four years later, we've always been in contact, always updated her. And how, um, how did you originally reach out to her? Or how did you have an original connection with her? I actually went to a brunch through actually me, my PR, uh, da David Magdale. He actually had a brunch, which a friend invited me to. I don't think David knew that I was like going to be there, but uh, he had a brunch for documentary filmmakers and a friend invited me to that. And basically there was like all these Asian documentary documentarians. And I was like, whoa, very cool. And Bing and Diane were there and I got to talk to them and I got... I told Diane my short film, which she really loved because she also kind of grew up very similarly to me. And so she kind of resonated with that. And we just kept in touch for the next four years. And with Daniel J. Chaufin, we actually, when we were, so we were starting the process of trying to look for an executive producer because I felt like what an executive producer could provide is like 
a lot of guidance, especially when it comes to sales, PR, from just any anybody who we just needed a lot more guidance from people who have already done it before right. and just kind of already knew the ropes to all these things. And so Sundance actually recommended Daniel J. Toffin, who has done so many amazing documentary projects. And I actually got his email and I just cold emailed him and explained my project. Could I have a meeting with you next week? Just here's a deck, here's a sample, whatever, take a look. And he said, yes, let's have a meeting. And I think talking a lot helped to, you know, we kind of listed out these are A, B, and C, D, D, A, B, and C, D things that we would like like from you. And this is what we can provide. And I think just being very upfront because people are really busy. These executive producers probably have like five plus projects going on at the same time. And there were so many times, even for Diane and I, Diane just couldn't come on board because it was, she was just so busy all the time. And I think I just had to change my perspective. And I said, actually, Diane, why don't you come on as an executive producer? Because it's a lot less commitment, a lot less kind of work that needs to really be done. And so she was like, wow, yes, I would, that would work so much better for me because being a day-to-day producer is a lot. Right. (laughs) And being an executive producer, you're almost like overseeing a project. Right. And so it really worked. We were kind of the stars aligned, same place, same time, just everything worked out. And that was, we fully brought them on probably maybe spring of this year, right before we got into Tribeca. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it would, I feel like a lot of, in order to even get into Tribeca, there was a lot of things that we needed to do in order to get in. And I felt like, I don't know, I, I'm glad that everything worked out, but it felt like we were like pulling teeth <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. and like crawling through the mud just, just so we could try to finish. And it was just really, really hard. To differentiate between like the day-to-day producer, that's the person that's like nitty gritty, like, mm-hmm. you know, a part of pretty much every phone call, like working a lot alongside you working with the budget um basically like everything and an an executive producer is more so somebody that is more established that can just open doors for you um sometimes i i've been learning this as well too but sometimes executive producers also invest into the film was this the case for you or was it more so just mentorship mostly mentorship because i already had uh, other executive producers who invested money so i think for me it's all about delegating and figuring out individual roles just because I didn't need, sure, it would have been great to have like so many investors be also executive producers. But I think for me, it was like, what can each person provide? And what are their, I say, always lean into your strengths and work with your strengths. So it's like, if you're good at this one thing, like that's exactly what I need help in. And so every person that was on my team from Eddie to Laura to Angela, I think I delegated certain tasks because I knew that they'd be good at that one thing. And in the beginning, when you didn't have grant money, the conversations that you navigated saying like, do you want to be a part of this? Like, how did you navigate the money talk in regard, like when you didn't have grant money and it was still a Mm -hmm. what if? I think still then it was really hard for me just because... Like nobody likes to ask for money. And luckily, uh, one of my investors is Bearcat Content and it was their first time investing. It was my first time having an investor. So like every part of this project was just, it just worked out so perfectly. And they really believed in us and gave us money without strings attached. Basically, whether we sell it, we don't sell it. Here's the money, make this. That was probably the easiest way to do it. I think obviously working with traditional investors is a little bit harder. And I think because I just didn't know how to navigate that space as easily, either I would refer to Eddie, who was a little bit more knowledgeable in that, whether he can talk to them, or I would mostly stick to grants. Because grants are pretty straightforward and they kind of list out exactly what they need and what they'll give you. Right. Because I was going to say, like, investor makes it sound like, you know, you have to have a return on investment, right? Like you have to, in order to take their money, you need to give them their money plus more. But it sounds like maybe that wasn't the case with Bearcat. Yeah, we were actually really fortunate just because it was their first endeavor and it was my first film. And I think they really believed in our project that they we came to an agreement where it was like no strings attached, go make it. And 
we would have never known from the very beginning that we would get the Sundance grant or even get in Tribeca. So it was, I think even for them, they were like, wow, this <laughs> very little thing kind of became a lot bigger than they ever anticipated. Wow. So basically it was kind of like a grant in a way. It was, it was, it was like, I, I think that was one of the parts I was so fortunate in this experience is that every single person that worked on my project, it just worked out. Everybody vibed and everybody was very communicative and we were all like for this project, which is, I can't say that for every project and you'll never really get an opportunity to really single-handedly pick every single person on your team. But if you do have the time to get to know them, like do the work because you do want everybody's support and everybody to all have the same goals. So let's say you're a first time director like yourself and you have like this project that you're super passionate Mm -hmm. about. You're excited. You've filmed some, you haven't raised any money yet, uh, but you're starting to put together like a sample and starting Mm -hmm. to put together some writing materials to maybe cold email some people. What, what was that process like for you? And did you like, what were the learnings? I'm sure that you had like different revisions and got feedback on like what makes a strong sample. Like what, what did you learn in that process and what got you those meetings like that mm-hmm. were just cold where they watch a sample, they saw your treatment and they were like, yep, I'm going to take a meeting. Like, what was that difference? Do you think? Probably clarity and directness just because you don't want to be wishy-washy in your ass and you knew exactly the film that you wanted to make. So I'm glad that the film that I created was exactly what I envisioned from the very beginning. I truly made no compromises because I made it on my own terms, which not everybody is fortunate to get, but I think there's just a lot of work to, to be done and like really honing down your vision and knowing exactly what you want. Um, Because there were so many iterations of the sample and it wasn't until 2020 where I felt like, okay, well, what's, what scares you? And you really have to go there because that's something that the audience will also see too. And how do you translate what you're trying to say in the most, I guess, even with cinematically, but in the clearest way through visual form. And so I got to a place where my sample was actually pretty clear in what the scene was, what I want to say and what the payoff is. And so when I applied, I think they really saw that. How long was your sample? Usually samples vary from different applications. So it can go from 20 minutes to 10 to five. Some people might say, oh, I'm only going to watch five minutes. So it's like, okay, wh- how wh- how can I entice them in the first five minutes and really tell them exactly what my story is? Because they will also be reading your application as well as watching it. But I, I do think your sample is the clearest way to let people know exactly what your film is in its form, in its message, just how you're going to communicate. And, uh, and so I you think, specifically made like a specific sample for every grant that you applied to essentially that required it. Yes. And no, I think that you should always have a, a sample that you're always going to go with depending on what their ask is and depending on what their length is, because the hard part about writing grants all the time is that it takes a lot of time away from actually editing. You're editing for the grants. So you're like, oh, but I'm supposed to be actually editing, but I'm editing for the grant. It's just taking so much more time. But that's probably the hardest part in the grant writing process, just because you're trying to do both at the same time. And it, it sometimes it's just not possible. So things may or may not make sense, but I think you just have to work by scenes okay, what can I communicate in this five minute scene or 20 minute scene? And how can I show them what the arc is? So they really understand. And for you specifically for that sample, like the five minute sample that you had, what, what scene did you include? I think for the Sundance one, there was a uh, recreation of a memory that I had in my liquor store that involved my dad and my mom. And it was kind of a very traumatic moment for me. So I think having them take a peek at what I went through, but also tell it in a way where they would enjoy to watch it as a, as an audience. It's hard because they're like, well, you don't know what just 
the everything I just set up and then I'm just only taking this part, which obviously in the application, you have to really explain what this sample is, where it comes from and what happens before and after. I think you just have to show something that's the core of your film. What's ex- what are you exactly trying to say and why, why are you trying to make this film and why is it so important? And how does a sample, uh, how is a sample different than a trailer? Because a trailer, I feel like, you know, it's one minute, it's, it's catchy, it's, you know, makes you want to click, but a sample kind of gets more at the core. What, what was, what was the difference in your like director's vision for the trailer Mm -hmm. versus the sample? Well, we never had a trailer, so I never really had to worry about it. I know that most trailers, it's probably the most exciting part of the film and most controversial or enticing. I think for a sample, it's really a scene. So if they require a 10 minute sample, you have to figure out which scene really translates your film. And so I think when you're just mapping out your film, it's like, what, what part is the most critical? And what do you think that a viewer or a person who's judging your work is going to really resonate with? And how can you which part actually translates your vision in the clearest way possible. A trailer basically is like a tease in a sense. And then the sample is, it, the, the, the trailer is actually teasing what is in the sample because the sample is really like the, the good part, the juicy part. And in the trailer, you almost want to like not show the juicy part. Like you're kind of saying like, ooh, this is why you want to watch. And then the sample is like, this is, this is the reason why you're watching. Kind of. Well, I think the trailer actually gives you a glimpse of the narrative arc mm-hmm. and where it will, how, how it starts, how it ends. Whereas I feel like for the sample, it's you're just taking like 10 minutes from wherever in the film and just showing them, this is, this is my vision, how I'm going to communicate it, what form it is, if I'm using voiceover, what shots I'm using, things like that. And you never had a trailer? Yeah, we still, still don't, don't have a trailer. <laughs> we still don't have a trailer. So eventually we we will. I think it's um So I guess like for someone again like in that scenario where trying to raise money, trying to raise grants for a first time film, is it more important to have a sample instead of a trailer? I think that really matters. So we actually used our short film as a quote unquote trailer mm-hmm. sample for people who are investing and in, in and we created a deck that basically explained how we're going to flesh out from the sample. So I think it's instead of actually showing a short version, you should just create a trailer. I think a sample for investors is better than a trailer sample is better than an actual sample for grants. They're very different because you're targeting to very different people. Many different versions of the same material. Yeah. yeah. So I'm there's sure. a lot of work. There's a lot of work. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. Biggest like takeaways for you personally as a, as a person, as a filmmaker Mm -hmm. working on liquor store dreams. Um, what, what stands out to you about your biggest learnings? I'm still learning and still there's so much more to learn. I'm glad I, I was able to do it. I'm glad that I got this far. It was just really hard and I don't think you'll get easier the next time I do it. I just obviously will know a little bit more, but I feel like the process of filmmaking just in general is just so difficult from raising funds to actually filming to post-production to getting all the deliverables to film festivals and even getting into a film festival is really difficult. So I don't know. I I definitely want to continue and explore stories that are very difficult, but I I think it's hard to figure out how to, like sustainability is a big question for me, just because it takes so much time to actually make something really, really good. I don't want to pump out things left and right just for the sake of content or films or whatever. So I think I want to be able to learn more sustainable practices that will help me in the long haul because there's more stories to tell about our community and without rest and actual funds, it's really hard to continue. And so I think kind of building that out, especially with documentaries, I feel like so many things blurs into whether things are done with consent or not. And then with your subjects as well, because your subjects could consent to being in the film, but when it comes out, it's a whole different journey for them. 
especially in the film festival side and having people receive their story is, and most of the story is like so personal. So a lot of people feel like they know you and know the people in our film. And so it's like, how do we navigate even that? And so I think I'm continuing to just learn how to be a better documentarian, be a more ethical filmmaker and create more sustainable practices. One other quick question that I forgot to ask. So one of one of the most poignant parts of the feature, I feel like, are your conversations, your candid conversations with your dad. Can you talk about, you know, for somebody else, whether they're making a film about it or not, somebody that wants to approach their parent or a a family member, a close friend dealing with, you know, topics of race and Mm -hmm. trauma and really hard topics. Like what, what kind of advice do you have for people that need to have those conversations? Mm -hmm. I don't know who said this, But you have to, a lot of our parents went through so much that I don't think we can even scratch the surface of everything that they went through to make it in America. And so innately, sometimes your perspective could be coming from privilege. And I think you have to approach topics of race or anti-Blackness or whatever with your parents as if, like, talk to their inner child and give them the space to respond because I think a lot of people aren't allowed that space to to have that conversation so a lot of people are like they don't want to say something wrong but it doesn't matter if they're saying something wrong because this is a safe space and that you're you're trying to have conversations even if they say something racist or slightly off instead of correcting them I think it's really about okay continue the conversation and tell me exactly how you feel and why you feel like that And then share your opinion. And I think a lot of our parents, because they came in with the mindset of let's just work hard, keep our head down, let's just do this and try to be successful, that they didn't come in knowing a lot of the history of America beforehand. So for them, it's probably really hard to grasp the concept of white supremacy, how it's so ingrained in every aspect of our lives. They won't see it as um, that a lot of communities are actually disenfranchised or they're in certain communities because of just economic whatever. And they don't really see the layers of everything underneath every interaction that they have and why things are the way that they are, whether, why are there, why are the communities in LA and the highways in certain places? Because they separate the rich from the poor. Like there's so many things that in our history that really explain and break down these, these practices that have been upholding white supremacy and things like that. And I don't, it's hard to explain to our parents. So instead of obviously talking about white supremacy, it's, I think you have to let them know exactly, I guess the history mm-hmm. and what they, that they can't really judge. They shouldn't be judging um, communities or because they don't have the knowledge and they don't have the equipment and tools to really navigate. Even talking about even beyond race, they aren't given the tools to communicate properly without breaking down into anger. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? And really talking to your parents as if they're children in a sense with a lot more empathy and kindness so they can try to get out what they want to say. And then that's like the main goal is just, just for them to communicate because I think a lot of people will say something and people will immediately shut them down, Right. which I totally get. Um, but you cannot have productive conversations if you're constantly shutting each other up. Got to have the safe space and yeah, just more empathy, right? Like just any, like whatever, whatever goes kind of set the, set the stage for, for kindness and empathy and actually like hash out what, what's underneath there. You know, we're always so scared to even go there in the first place. And it comes from a lack of not knowing and a lot mm-hmm. lack of education. So, um, yeah, I got chills. <laughs> <laughs> That's some good stuff. That's some good stuff. Um, amazing. Well, congratulations again. Um, what does what does the next like five years look for you? What is what what else are you cooking up? Yeah. Well, I always thought I would actually do narrative films, uh, but now I think having done this doc, I actually want to do both. So I'm kind of going back on the drawing board with my narrative that I was writing before, Liquor Store Babies, Liquor Store Dreams, and trying to figure out how do I make it better and 
I'm really open. I think I'm so flexible that I I just love the medium of entertainment and storytelling that whether it's documentaries, narratives, or TV shows, I kind of want to be able to do it all. And so I'm really excited what the next five years will hold for me, whether if whether it's me just being a producer or actually being a director, because there are so many stories, but I, I want to be pretty selective just because there's a lot of stories that I, I feel like have not been told, especially from a female perspective that, yeah, I, I they should be told. <laughs> Amazing. Where where can our audience find you? I'm on socials on all of them. I just got into TikTok, which I really love. <laughs> um, so that's been really fun. But I think the one, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Letterbox, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. What's Letterbox. Oh, Letterbox is a. Uh, it basically you chronicle um, every film you that you watch. Oh wow! So I, I watch movies pretty often. So I just. And I can't remember everything I've watched, so I'll just log everybody. Yeah. Fun. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, So, for being on the podcast. I had such a great time uh, talking with you about Liquor Store Dreams, and I'm excited to have you uh, on, on this podcast, and I know that everyone is going to benefit from hearing this. So well, thank, thank you, you so for much. having me. This was really good. That is a wrap on today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review and share it with a friend. If you are a doc filmmaker and love talking doc, then you should join our doc club. All the info and all the links will be in the show notes. Take care and I will see you next time.